Hello everyone, I'm back with another video. So in my last video, someone requested for me to make another video on um, the questions that I was asked for my Imperial interview. So this is what the video is going to be about. Um, so I'm just going to talk about the technical question that I was asked for the one-to-one -one interview and also the, the group tasks that I had to do. Um, with uh, a bunch of other interviewees or applicants. Keep in mind that there were three group tasks that I had to do, but I just, I cannot remember what the second one was. I just do not have any recollection of it whatsoever. So I'm just going to be talking about the first and third ones. So forgive me for that. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and start with the technical question in which I was asked at the end of the one-to-one -one interview. Um, so the person who was interviewing me, they verbally explained to me um, the problem. Basically, the problem was um, there's this water tank and there's a boat floating on top of the water and there is a tin can on the boat and what happens is the tin can is pushed into the water so it's from this to this and the question was does the water level rise or fall? Right. I'm just going to go straight into the solution in this video, but if you're curious as to how I answered it on the spot during the interview, um, I talk about it in my previous video. It's useful to think of the default scenario as just the water tank with the bloat floating atop, so let's just pretend there is no tin can. So let's say the tin can falls into the water, it is going to sink because the tin can is more dense than the water and so it will displace the water which causes the water level to rise. Um, so essentially it's the tin can's weight that makes that makes this happen but um, its big weight is confined into a relatively small volume which contributes to a larger density so here volume really is the deal breaker. So for example even if an object was really dense and heavy, but its volume was minuscule, all that matters eventually in terms of how much the water rises, the water level rises, is the volume. On the other hand, when t the tin can is on top of the small boat, its weight is pushing down on the boat and hence the water, and it is this downwards acting force that the, that the rise in water level depends solely on. So. With that logic, the water level would likely rise to a greater height when it is on top of the boat um, instead of when it sinks in the water, which means that the water level would fall if the tin can is pushed into the water from the boat. Um, I also talked about this in my last video, but um, for the practical question, what they, what they really want to see is how you think and how you would approach um, the question and they just want to see you know, whether you have the critical thinking skills to be able to tackle you know, a question like this and um, I, I had a physics question because that's obviously related to my major and so they just want to see whether you, you can think and you can you know, have that logic to solve um, problems in your respective uh, subject. For the group tasks, you're not expected to have prepared for these because um, they aren't really material that you learn at school or anything like that. So um, I would say the best that you can do is just learn to think. The first group task, we were given these groups of different um, shapes with different characteristics such as filled and unfilled shapes as in you know color filled then different colors and different number of edges what we were told to do was something along the lines of separating a given group of shapes into individual categories and um, you know hearing about it, hearing that instruction the first time you might think oh, it's not so hard, you're just grouping a bunch of shapes, right? But once I got to doing it, I was you know, sort of confused because there were so many characteristics which overlapped, um, 
which meant that if you define a number of categories, let's say based on color, number of edges, and whether, whether they were filled or not, um, you could put a shape in one category, but it would also fit in another. Now, I'm not sure um, whether there was a definitive approach to this problem, but um, what my group and I did was um, we did the categorizing um, based on just one characteristic at a time. Um, so that this solution would seem really simplistic and straightforward, but I personally don't think the solution was what mattered. We were flustered at first because it just wouldn't make sense to separate the shapes into different groups because of the overlapping characteristics. So in the first place, what they're telling us to do is very vague and unclear. So we had to talk about that as a group and have a discussion and come up with something to present as a solution, even though there were no clear cut instructions. I mean, they gave us instructions, but you know, it was, it was, it was confusing and vague, and there was no practical way to do this. Um, in a way, it's also a problem whose solution, I guess, is is subjective instead of objective. So as I said, all my memories of the second task have been wiped clean from my brain, so I will be jumping directly to the third group task. When I saw that third task, I was sort of excited because it was actually related to something medical. Um, it was like a medical ap application. Um, and it was about the, the metal rods that are used in surgery for broken bones or fractured bones, specifically in the ulna, which is um, the bone in the forearm. The forearm here. We were given a, f a graph and some statistics. Um, and then they also had a bunch of questions for us. Um, and they, there were about four or five different brands of metal rods, and they were of different appearance, size, etc. And we were given data on which ones were most effective, or I think it was something like which ones led to least uh, to most infections. It was something along the lines of that. And we were asked to explain the main features we noticed from the graphs and also to infer conclusions. For example, the more sh uh, smoothly shaped the rods, um, the more they yielded better results overall. And let's say the bulky ones didn't do as well. Um, one of the questions I remember they had for us were possible causes of a fracture in the ulna. And if I remember correctly, we were asked to put forward suggestions for better rods, um, or was it to explain why certain certain features would result in, in worse results and others better results? I can't remember too vividly, but essentially it was about you know, our ability to analyze information and to think about unfamiliar unfamiliar topics. I've mentioned this in my previous video. Again, I, there are a lot of things I've mentioned in my previous video, but it's important for the group task that you try to speak up whenever you can, um, because otherwise you're not giving your examiners something to work with. Um, even just trying to initiate um, discussion would earn you points, because it would show that you would be able to work well in group situations and that's a positive trait that they look favorably upon. Alright, so I'm going to end this video at that. If you want me to talk about anything else regarding my imperial application process or really anything, you can leave that in the comments below and I'll try my best to help you with that. Goodbye.